Hi everyone, welcome to another video on organic chemistry. Good to see you all. Today we're going to wrap up unit three. Let's take a look at key concepts. Unit three, part three. We are starting in the middle of this document. Last document took us halfway through, right? There we go. Okay, so we're talking about nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions. And we have to remember the order of reactivity, right? We have the acid chlorides, most reactive, most number of reactions, because they're so reactive, lots of things they can do. Then we have anhydrides, intermediate reactivity. Then the esters, relatively stable. And then we have the amides, very stable. Acid chlorides, anhydrides, esters, amides. So. We've already talked about acid chlorides. That's what the screen is talking about. Take a look at the previous video for a review. And then we also did the anhydrides. So now the list of reactions is getting shorter. But the pattern's repeating. The mechanisms are going to be very, very similar to what you've already seen. So let's just knock these down one by one. OK, so we're going to look at the esters. And previously, we started with acid chlorides and anhydrides. And the first reaction was hydrolysis. Now for the acid chlorides and anhydrides, they're very active, right? Acid chlorides, anhydrides, then esters and amides. So ordinary water, neutral water was, was enough. It's a weak nucleophile, but the acid chlorides and anhydrides were so reactive, boom, fault. they go in the water or just moisture in the air and they react. Not true with the esters. So that's the first thing to note. Um, there's no reaction if you just have neutral water. Acid chlorides and hydrates, they do react with neutral water. Esters are more reactive. You must have an acid as a catalyst or you must have a base, right? So if we uh, just start with a simple ester, you can add hydronium ion and they can be at any of the forms, right? You could write H3O plus, you could write H plus in water, you could, specify an acid, maybe sulfuric acid and water. Those are all suitable forms of the reagent, acid hydrolysis. And what we're just going to do is split it. Hydrolysis means to cut with water. So you split the ester and then you add the pieces of water. So to the carbonyl group, the C double bond O group, right? So you cut the ester in half. We got the left-hand side. From water, you add OH, and water has two H's, so the other H goes to the other piece to form an alcohol. And hey, this is just the reverse of Fischer sterification. To make an ester, you start with the carboxylic acid and the alcohol, add an acid catalyst, and you form an ester. So actually, we've already, we've already seen this mechanism. So we're just going to undo it. Um, the second way of making an ester, I'm sorry, second way of hydrolyzing an ester is by using a base. So raise the pH with sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide works just as well. Add water, cutting with water, and do the same thing. And if you write on the exam the same two products, carboxylic acid and alcohol, I will give you full credit. You're telling me, yeah, esters hydrolyze to carboxylic acids and alcohols. But if you do this reaction in the lab, this is a catalyst. It's still present at the end of the reaction. And what we form? A carboxylic acid, base and acid. The product is actually going to react with the catalyst at the end. And you're actually going to form the anion of the carboxylic acid and the alcohol, that's not gonna react with the base. So you can give me these reactants, I'm sorry, these products also either form, you get full credit on the exam. Just be aware in the lab, you actually get these molecules. One more little detail, base catalyst hydrolysis actually has a name, it's saponification. Sapo comes from the Latin word for soap. So Literally, saponification means making soap. So take a look at the sample test. Somewhere in there, I think it's where you predict the products. I actually have um, 
one method of making soap. And it comes about from um, boiling animal fat with lye, one of the earliest bases. And so this is an old ancient reaction on how to make soaps. And as we understood the chemistry of making soaps, we realized, wait, all we're doing is hydrolyzing an ester or lots of esters. More on that in a minute. Let's look at the mechanism though. Okay, so let's start with the acid catalyzed mechanism. Come on, pen. start with hydronium or any form. And what we've seen before <laughs> is that when the acid is a catalyst, the carbonyl group, the oxygen with the double bond, not the ether-like oxygen, the double bonded oxygen is the one that picks up the H plus. Hydronium loses an H and a plus. So hydronium ion turns into the water molecule, which is a weak nucleophile. But now this has been activated with the acid catalyst. It's a better electrophile, seeks these electrons more diligently, more aggressively. And now the water molecule has the capacity to bump up the pi bond. Yeah, so there's that reoccurring pattern, bump up the pi bond with your nucleophile. Okay, so put the water molecule here, kind of coming underneath. Um, this oxygen is making three bonds, so it's positively charged. And then what we want to do, we want to hydrolyze or cut this bond, cut the ester. So we need to get rid of this group. But you can't do it now. You can't say, hey, lone pair, fall down, kick out this group, because right now it leave as a negatively charged oxygen. Wait, this is acid catalyzed. So in the solution, you've acidified it. There's a bunch of cations there, a bunch of H pluses. So it's highly unlikely to create something negative when the whole solution is full of H, full of H pluses. So it's a good way of just kind of keeping that in mind, keep you on, it'll help you write the correct mechanism. Um, if it's acid catalyzed, everybody should be either be neutral like this one or positive. This one's positive, that one's neutral. This one's positive. Okay, um, if it's acid catalyzed, if you have anything negative, ooh, that's a mistake, most likely. Chemistry though, has exceptions. We've seen exceptions to that before. Okay, so we want this group to leave, but not as a negative species. So, hey, let's go grab an H plus from this molecule, that side of the molecule rather. I'll make a bond to that extra hydrogen. Use up that lone pair to create this covalent bond. Everything else is gonna be unchanged. I'll change H2O to just an O and an H and write it this way. And now the lone pair can fall down and this oxygen has three bonds, it's positive. And it can kick out this group as the alcohol. Draw it over here. Okay, so what's gonna happen? Uh, the lone pair comes down to restore the double bond. We still have a methyl group to the left. We have the OH group. And then this O with an H and CH3, yeah, that became this molecule. If you want to flip it around and draw it this way, totally acceptable. When you're drawing molecules, you decide how you want them drawn. These two are the same. Let's see what's the last step. Um, we gotta get rid of this H and plus. You can use the ethanol molecule, the, the alcohol if you want. There's a lone pair on the oxygen. However, there's a whole bunch of water here. So it's more likely the water molecule in higher concentration is gonna grab an H plus. There we go. The water becomes hydronium and the, uh, this intermediate turns into your carboxylic acid. If you wanna redraw this over here, you can. You don't have to when you're mapping out the mechanism. All righty. And um, gosh, the reverse of this is esterification. So that's another way to do the mechanism. Uh, start with carboxylic acid and the acid. 
then add the alcohol molecule and create your ester and then erase the arrows and go backwards if you want. Let's look at base catalyzed hydrolysis. It's shorter, it's easier to do. And for comparison, we'll just start with the same ester, but this time base catalyzed. So bring in hydroxide ion. And the big difference here, and get the other one up there, there it is. Water had to bump up the pi bond before. Water, we know from SN2 reactions, is a poor nucleophile. Hydroxide ion, though, is a strong nucleophile, a good one. So it doesn't need this ester activated. It can immediately attack and bump up the pi bond. The double bonded oxygen becomes negatively charged. And then now this negatively charged oxygen can restore the double bond. And guess what? Sometimes this bond breaks. If this breaks, the, the covalent bond will turn into lone pair and oxygen and recreate hydroxide ion. And technically I should change this into an equilibrium arrow. You don't have to do that on my exams. It does go back and forth. And that actually explains some of the stability of the ester. You're heating up with strong base and it takes a long time to hydrolyze because it kind of gets stuck here in equilibrium. Occasionally, this bond will break. And as the lone pair comes down the restored dull bond and this group leaves, you actually make the carboxylic acid, but you make this base too. And now let me ask you this, hydroxide ion versus this anion, who's more basic? Well, they both have oxygen bearing the negative charge. So oxygen is fairly electronegative. That makes this, both of these species, hydroxide and methoxide ion, very basic. But at the methyl group, remember from electrophilic aromatic substitution, ortho directing groups, the methyl group is a weak activator and it's activating the oxygen, making it more basic. Hydrogen, neither activating nor deactivating. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't get activated. So it turns out this is a stronger base. Then this one, I know hydroxide is a strong base, but in comparison with this one, it's actually weaker. So nature is going to prefer to create this when the lone pair comes down. It wants, it wants to bump out this group because it's a more stable leaving group. And again, I'm just overemphasizing that hydrolysis is difficult for esters and that's a good reason why. Oh, but if this bond breaks, well, you might ask, well, can this step be reversible? Well, theoretically, maybe the lone pair could come up here and bump up the pi bond and go back here. But as the lone pair approaches this acid and we have a base, no, the lone pair is going to grab this. Ooh, let's back up a step. If you stop here, I give you full credit. You've actually shown me that you've made the carboxylic acid. The anion here, I've been, been lenient on my exams, you could either finish it up and say, hey, um, scroll back up the reagents real quick. The reagents are base and water. So if you wish, again, it's optional, you can then throw in a water molecule here and then say this base grabs um, hydrogen from water to turn into the alcohol right? Because the carboxylic acid and alcohol are formed from hydrolysis. And then hydroxide, sorry, water loses the hydrogen to reform the hydroxide ion, which is a catalyst. But you know what? More likely, and again, this is why it's optional, more likely the strong base is going to react with this hydrogen and create the anion of the carboxylic acid. And then when this lone pair grabs the H plus, then you get the ethanol molecule. So these are the more likely products here. Anyways, 
gets a little dicey here. I'm thinking as a teacher, how much detail am I requiring my students? Well, let's just work on the main point. The main idea is esters get split, hydrolyzed by base or acid. And the products of hydrolysis of esters are carboxylic acids and alcohol. So you almost have it here, you almost have it here. If you stop here or keep going here, I'm cool either way. What else we got? Oh, a little review about bases. Sorry, not review of bases, soaps. Sorry for the small print, let's zoom in a little bit. So got a bar of soap over here, lathering up your hands. Chemically, what's going on? Well, here's some structures of soap molecules. You hydrolyze an ester, so you get the carboxylic acid. And then in animal fat and other molecules that produce soaps, you have these long chains of carbon, which are single bonded CCs, carbon-carbon. That's a nonpolar covalent bond. And you have the CH bond, also nonpolar covalent. So this long chain of carbons is very greasy or nonpolar. However, where the carboxylic acid is, you created an anion. That's ionic. Ionic bonds are very polar. So this part of the molecule loves to go in the water. This greasy part doesn't. Oh, and then by comparison, this is kind of cool. We'll, we'll hope to cover more of this in our last unit on biochemistry. But if you want to read more, I got it on the screen here. Let's just focus on the soap molecule. So the way a soap molecule works to clean dishes and your car and your hands is down here. Um, if you look at, this is not a molecule. This is just a collection of molecules and particles that make up dirt. It's unspecified, it's just a blob. Essentially, dirt consists of nonpolar molecules. So think of a whole bunch of them stuck onto your skin. You've been, you know, working out in the dirt, whatever. <laughs> Got a bunch of this greasy dirt on your skin. You want to get rid of it. You rinse it off. It's not coming off because light dissolves like and oil and water don't mix. Dirt is nonpolar. Water is polar. It's not going to come off with just simple water. Um, your skin is somewhat nonpolar. At least it's less polar than water. So the dirt is going to adhere to the skin, not go in the water. But you lather up with some soap, and you put some soap molecules in your water. And then I know they kind of look like long tails, little mo molecules here. Um, it's just a shortcut for drawing these, right? So this end, the circle group, the carboxylic acid end, is the polar portion of a soap molecule. The greasy tail, that's just the zigzag part. And so you get a whole bunch of these molecules starting to stick to the dirt with their greasy tails. And then they stick the carboxylic acid part, the anion of the carboxylic acid, into the water because that part is polar, likes to stick to the water. And if you get enough soap surrounding the whole thing, now this whole blob, this collection of molecules, has a surface, think three dimensionally, the surface has all these anions of carboxylic acids. So the whole surface is water soluble. And the whole thing can kind of just kind of float in the water and get washed down the drain. Kind of cool. We'll go over this again in the biochemistry section. A little preview there. Wet our appetite, if you will. Ooh, let's uh, unzoom here. Okay, that's it for the esters. I am kind of lying a little bit. We saw a bunch of ester reactions. You know, esters react with Grignards. They react with lithium aluminum hydride. Um, so the new reactions are simply just hydrolysis of um, esters. Nice. Let me double check. It's too short. It is too short. There's one more. Acid chloride, anhydride, esters, amides. So you can work down the list. Acid chlorides has the greatest number of reactions because they can make acid um, anhydrides. Acid chlorides can make esters. Acid chlorides can make amides, and they do a whole bunch of other reactions. When you get to the esters, it's hard to work uphill, but you can still go downhill. So the acid chloride, 
anhydride esters can create amides. So just to complete the series, yes, there is a reaction you should be aware of. You can take an ester and you can add an amide. I'll put in a primary one, primary amine, sorry, add an amine, and the lone pair will bump up the pi bond and kick out the alcohol group, the oxygen group. We're not going to go over the mechanism because it's just not a useful reaction. But again, you should be aware that esters do react with the means. It's a slow reaction. Um, esters are fairly stable, so it's not, it's not a good reaction. But yes, technically, if you heat them up, let them boil long enough, you will create amides. Um, there's a little blurb here about yields are low without base. We saw that pattern before. We had to make sure we added the base, but the means are bases. So just use an excess if you really want to do it this way. And then you can use ammonia, a primary mean, which I did here, or a secondary mean, and you can create different amides. It's not a very useful reaction. If you really need an amide, use it, an acid chloride or even a carboxylic acid with DCC. Easier methods, less work, and they work really well, unlike this one. There we go. We're done with the ester reactions, acid chloride, anhydrides, esters, amides. Short list of reactions for amides, beginning with hydrolysis. And it's the same pattern we saw with the esters. First of all, of those four derivatives of carboxylic acids, amides are the most stable. So plug, draw, throw them in the water, even boiling water, no reaction. You, um, you need an acid catalyst or a base catalyst. And it turns out you need concentrated acids or concentrated bases. And you have to boil these like overnight or several days to get complete hydrolysis of amides. They're very stable. And actually that's a good thing. Um, proteins make up our, a lot of the skin, our bodies are made up of proteins. Uh, we don't wanna start dissolving, reacting in the rain. No, and then if we get a little lemon juice on our skin, we don't want them dissolving away either, right? It's gonna take concentrated acids boiling to really start dissolving proteins that make up our skin. So it's a good thing that amides are very stable. It would be a better thing that nature decided to use the amides as building blocks for proteins. Cool, but concentrated acids, concentrated bases, a lot of time you can break up the amides. So let's just start with amide, um, add the acid catalyst, boil reflux, and eventually you break it, you cut with water. You add the components of water, OH to the carbonyl group, the other H to the amine. I'll draw it this way. And then, hey, hydrolyzing amides creates carboxylic acids and amines. You can take an amine and carboxylic acid, add DCC to go backwards, right? What else? Um, technical point, you have an acid catalyst, amines are bases. So actually at the end of the reaction, then the amine that you create will react with the acid catalyst. So you have the carboxylic acid and then you have the conjugate acid of the amine. So if you want to draw those two, I'll smile and say, hey, you remembered. And if you give me these two, I'll still smile. It's like, good job. You remembered the hydrolysis of mites. I'll take either set of, of products. They both work. Similar pattern, if you use a base, you can say, hey, base or acid, hydrolyze amides to carboxylic acids and amines, full credit. Or in the lab, you're refluxing the, the amide with base. So after you make the carboxylic acid, you don't need heat. This is a very exothermic reaction. Strong base, weak acid, they react. And you form the, that's ugly. You form the anion of a carboxylic acid. And you have the amine. 
Let's look at the mechanisms. I think they're gonna look familiar, which is good, right? Repeating patterns helps us remember things. Start with, instead of an ester, change the O here to an N. And let's do the acid catalyze first. Same pattern, the carbonyl oxygen grabs the, the acid. Huh, good. Um, saw that with the ester hydrolysis. Hydronium loss on H, no more three H's on O. There's only two H's on O. And then the plus got carried off with hydrogen. Yeah, we form neutral water. And then we bump up the pylon. Now let's move this out of the way. What over here? Sure. And then what remains of the amide is we lost the pi bond, won't pair on this oxygen. And then we attach the water molecule. What did we do with the ester? Um, we wanna get rid of this group, but if it leaves now, it's negative. Now it's acid catalyzed. Everybody's gotta be neutral or positive. So hey, lone pair nitrogen, have a hydrogen. Same pattern that we saw with the esters. So now nitrogen had one hydrogen, picked up a second one. We had a water molecule, but lost an H and a plus. It's just an OH group. And now it's ready to leave. So bring down the lone pair, kick out the nitrogen. Hey, chem majors, this bond's more likely to break, right? So as it comes down, oh, sorry, not here. So back up a step, Dennis. Um, so did you just catch my error? If it leaves now, oxygen will be negative. Wait, this is acid catalyzed, can't have a negative leaving group. But instead, um, back up here in this step, the lone pair could have came back down, kicked out water. Or it can wait a step and kick out the amine, which is how it progresses the product. But then let me ask you, which is a better leaving group? Having the lone pair come down and kick out water or having the lone pair come down and kick out amine? Well, amines are weak bases. Water is a very weak base. Nature likes to form more stable things. So this is reactive, it's a weak base. Water is less reactive or more stable. So again, this is helping explain why amides are difficult to hydrolyze because if you can get the water molecule to attack, it's weak nucleophile, this is fairly stable even though it's activated. It's gonna take some time to do that. Even if it does that, sometimes the lone pair comes down and kicks out the water molecule because it's such a good leaving group. You have to keep boiling it, keep going back in equilibrium. Eventually, hopefully, this bond will break sometime, not this one. And then you go here and now the amine is a weak base. It can remove the H plus, you could, Let's get rid of this H plus. Um, you can also bring another water molecule because that's the reagent, hydronium, H plus and water. This is what we did with the with uh, ester, so you might as well do the same thing. Uh, water grooves the H plus or the amine can, means are weak bases. You have the carboxylic acid. We get this, and then we get any, you know, the hydronium ion. There is a reaction between this weak acid. That's a base. Weak base, the means are weak bases and hydronium. That explains why sometimes the nitrogen is positively charged, right? We said that was a possible product. You don't have, you're not required to show that on the mechanism. Okay, let's take a look at the base catalyzed mechanism. It's very, very similar to ester hydrolysis or saponification. Here we got the good nucleophile that immediately bumps up the pi bond. Whoops, that's a, kind of overshot into there a little bit. It's 
And then the ester hydrolysis, we immediately brought down the lone pair, reformed double bond, and we kicked out the leaving group. Now that leaves negative and that's okay because it's base catalyzed or intermediates are either neutral or negative. And then here's the question for the chem majors. Hey, when this lone pair comes down, which bond is weaker? This bond breaking to create hydroxide ion or this bond breaking to create the, what is this? A, a nitrogen negative charge. Well, who's more stable? Maybe a better question is who's more basic? Negative nitrogen or negative oxygen? Well, oxygen is more electronegative. It can deal with the negative charge. Nitrogen, less so. Not very electronegative. It's like freaking out with this negative charge. It's a stronger base. That's what we saw with the ester hydrolysis. As in comparison, hydroxide ion is a weaker base. So most of the time when this lone pair comes down, hydroxide leaves and we shift back and forth in equilibrium here and not go anywhere. But on rare occasions, this bond will break. And now we progress and hydrolyze the amide. And at this point, this strong base can remove that. You can use more hydroxide ion. You decide, wait, you don't have to go any farther. This is the optional step. You can just stop here if you like. Let's see, um, oh yeah, one more reaction for amides, just to round this out. If you have an amide, you can treat it with lithium aluminum hydride and it creates an amine. Remember when you're using a Grignard, sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride or Dibol, you always add hydronium ion as your second step. These are powerful bases. So you have to neutralize them at the end with hydronium ion. And then what you do is you actually just lose the double bond and you create amines. That looks, hopefully that looks very similar to hydrolysis of nitriles. When you hydrolyze a nitrile, you also form, oops, let's put two H's on there. You also form amines. So that's cool. They kind of parallel. Let me check. Did I forget anything? I don't think so. Technically, that's the end of unit three. There's a special topic, though. You do need to know this, but it's just an application, not new, just an application of reactions we've already talked about. And it's kind of cool. Let's look at plastics. There's an additional handout on, on Canvas. And also, oh, I got some screenshots of it here. But you can create plastics and fabrics, polyesters and nylons. Uh, poly means many. So polyesters, polyester fabric, if you inspect that, um, you analyze it chemically, you'll discover that there's many, many, many esters present within those fibers, the molecules that make up the fabric. Uh, nylons is another word for polyamides. So nylons are molecules that contain many, many poly, many, many amides. Um, these are huge, long, long chains of molecules. Um, and the word for that is polymers or macromolecules these long, long chains. And um, they're very similar to like DNA, RNA, and proteins, complex carbohydrates. Those are actually nature's um, polymers or macromolecules. And the whole idea is that the mer part of polymer, the mer part, um, it's talking about repeating units. So hopefully if you've seen DNA before, you know about the four base pairs, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Uh, uracil and RNA, um, those are repeating patterns, uh, building blocks of DNA. And uh, you just connect them all together and make these long chains of DNA. And here we're going to do the same thing, making fabrics or plastics. 
just take these esters and repeat them many, many, many times, and we get a polymer that we call polyester. Okay, that's kind of the overview. But let's get a little more technical. Let's talk about how to make a polyester. Well, there's lots of ways. Think about all the reactions that can make a single ester. So that's step one. Choose a reaction that makes esters. For example, a carboxylic acid and alcohol, Fischer esterification. Or you can look at an acid chloride with an alcohol or an anhydride with an alcohol. They make esters too. Lots of ways of making esters. And then you switch or modify the reaction so that they're difunctional. I'll explain that more in a minute. Um, technically, it just means instead of having one, let's say, carboxylic acid, you have a molecule with two, two carboxylic acids. And instead of having a molecule with just one OH group, one alcohol group, you have a molecule with two alcohol groups. There's two functional groups, or it's difunctional, as two functional groups per molecule. And that's the recipe for making polyesters. What if you want a nylon or a polyamide? Well, same pattern. Step one, find a reaction that makes amides. Carboxylic acid with an amine and DCC. Um, acid chloride with an amine. All, any reaction that makes an amide. And then make them difunctional. Start with a molecule with two carboxylic acids and add a second molecule with two amines. And then that's a recipe for making nylons. Okay, let's see a little more detail on that. Yeah, recycle all those plastics. What's in here? Um, plastic water bottles are made from a polyester. I know it's not a fabric, but if you look, if you could look at the molecules that make up a plastic water bottle, you'll find lots and lots of esters, many esters. Technically, it's called polyethylene terephthalate. I'll show it here in a second. Um, esters can be made from acid chlorides and alcohols, but it's actually in the in industry, in the real world, it's an easy reaction if you do a transesterification. So I'll show you that. And it might appear in the homework. Um, it's just easier to do in the laboratory. So we'll see an example of that in the homework. Here's our plastic water bottle. Uh, recycle code number one, polyethylene terephthalate, PEAT. <laughs> Here's the structure. Hey, and there's the ester. This is one unit, one mer. Actually, it's two. You take an alcohol. Well, there's two alcohol groups on this molecule on this difunctional compound. And you take a carboxylic acid. Well, there's two carboxylic acids on this molecule. It's also difunctional. And then these two combine the little acid catalyst to make an ester unit. And now this side can react with a second molecule, not the same one. If it formed, if it reacted the same one, make a circle or a ring. Now you get a different molecule to add this end. And you start building a chain out this way with a bunch of esters. And on this side, this alcohol reacts with another acid and you build it out this way. And you make really, really long molecules that way. More pictures, more pictures. Okay, if you had to draw the overall structure, Sometimes we just want the simplest picture. So give me the simplest repeating pattern. And other times we want to see more detail. So you look that within this bracket and this bracket over here, they're the same. So here, whoever drew this decided, I'm going to draw the same unit twice. Didn't have to. You could just draw that repeating pattern once. Um, you can also break it up differently. Like this is broken up right after the O. Whoever broke up this pattern said, I'm going to keep one carbon. So it's just as long as you look at it and say, OK, it's one carbon, then O, the carboxylic acid group, benzene, the carboxylic acid group, one carbon, and then the other side is an O. Um, these two could be linked at the end. Hopefully, you can stare at this and see that this group has the same number of atoms as this group. And they do, in fact, represent the same molecules. Long repeating chains of this block. Here, more pictures. Let's try and explain a little more detail. And we'll talk about the actual reaction taking place. So let's say 
you start with an acid chloride reaction, reacting with the alcohol. We'd have a little pyridine in here, right? And the acid scavenger is called to wipe up the HCl that's being produced as a byproduct. But here, step by step, let's kind of go through the process. If we have one molecule adding to another molecule, these two groups can collide. The acid chloride and the alcohol could then form an ester. But on the other side over here, and on the other side over here, there's still reactive sites. So this is not the final product. It took two units together, two mers, a dimer. We got two units that link together. So that's a simple nickname for this intermediate. And now this dimer, well, sometimes this dimer, the alcohol end, could react with a second diacid chloride, difunctional group. Now this carboxylic acid and the alcohol can link to form a new ester. But hey, there's still a carboxylic acid on both ends. We now have a trimer, if you want a word for it, because we had a carboxylic acid, the alcohol, and a second carboxylic acid, one, two, three units, trimer. That's not the only way it can react. What if you go back to the dimer? John here, here's the dimer. And now let's say, this carboxylic acid reacts with this alcohol. So move this molecule on this side. And now we got the acid chloride groups, well, the resters now in the middle, and we have alcohols on either end. We have a new trimer. And it's not done reacting, right? These alcohol groups can react with new acid chlorides. The acid chlorides can react with new alcohol molecules. And so we have other options or two dimers can react with each other. So the alcohol, carboxylic acid can link together. And now we have a tetramer. Tetramer. If you want a word for it, it's got the acid chloride group, the alcohol group, the acid chloride group, alcohol. Um, I keep saying acid chloride, but now it's an ester. What else can we do? Well, that's not done yet either. Maybe you can have that trimer react with the dimer and form a pentamer. Stir that for a while. Um, the ends are still reactive though. So you can keep on going. And so in order to get the fit on the page, wow, there's more. Let's put this down here. Yeah. So you can see the repeating we got like what remains of the acid chloride and the ester, the alcohol, the original acid chloride, the alcohol, the acid chloride. Yeah, it's just repeating. And then I bent the molecules so I could fit it on the page and we're not done yet. These molecules are getting really, really huge. So I should have checked, this is probably cotton, maybe it's polyester. Now find something polyester and look at a thread. That's not one molecule that's down here. That's lots and lots of these molecules, long train, straightened out, not curved back and forth like it is drawn on the screen, stacked together to form a fiber that's woven into a thread. So lots and lots of these chains come together to create a fabric. Or in the case of water bottle, yeah, thick plastic film. It's a bunch of these long chains all stacked together, sticking together. Um, all the chains are not the same length. So if you take a quick glance at that, just kind of round out our understanding of polymers. If you have a bunch of these difunctional compounds, not saying whether they're two alcohols or two acid chlorides, you decide, well, as you start doing the reactions, these two could link together, these two could link the, together, those two could link together, and that's your dimers that are forming. And now, like this dimer can react up here to form this piece. That one can form a dimer. These two can link together, form a tetramer and a trimer, and then maybe start linking together and maybe they don't. So now we have a chain with five mers. We got a longer one. Oh wait, we got a dimer here. So we're running out of room 
we're running out of materials. So we're gonna end up with chains of different lengths. And that's one of the properties of polymers. And there's a lot of research and successful research trying to develop ways so that all the chains are the same length. And that has different properties. Um, it's usually desired to have chains with similar lengths, usually has better properties for use in applications than a random or sort of different chain lengths. It usually makes for less useful um, plastic properties. That's not on the exam. It's just interesting, interesting polymer chemistry, which by the way, you can just take as a course, a polymer chemistry course. And now you got a head start on it. Let's take a, a last look at amides, polyamides, your nylons. And all we're gonna do is change from an alcohol to an amine, difunctional amine. And I'll stick with acyclorides, but you don't have to. This is only one way of making an amide with an acid chloride and an amine. There's the amide. Uh, the nylons have some nicknames. There's a chain of six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And there's a chain of six, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So the nickname for this polymer, this nylon, this polyamide is nylon 6-6. Six, six. So nylon 6-10, yeah, that would have 10 carbons between the nitrogens. Not on the exam, just interesting. And it's gonna follow the same route, long, long chains, making dimers and trimers and tetramers and linking together. Yeah, same pattern as the polyesters. One useful application of the polyamides or nylons is bulletproof vests. So you have a benzene ring. Hey, what do we know about benzene? One of nature's favorites, very stable, very strong. And amides, very stable, acid chlorides, anhydrides, esters, and amides. So you combine those groups, very strong groups. And then you get some hydrogen bonding happening between these chains, a whole chains to chains, right? So think about these long polymers, really, really long chains, stretch them out and one long chain will hydrogen bond to the next one. Hydrogen bond by itself is not very strong, but if you have multiple ones, that's gonna create something very, very strong. A strong material that's good enough to stop a bullet. There we go. So I got a bulletproof vest here. Looking inside, you see this woven plastic, this nylon. And you might ask, well, how long is the chain? Can I see it here? You really can't. If you zoom in on the picture, okay, zoom in, let's go zoom in. And you pick out some fibers. It's kind of blurry, but you see like so those little fibers are sticking off at the end. Oh, the width of this is not one molecule thick. Uh, one little thread here is lots and lots of these chains all stacked together. And together, they may, and it's three dimensional, together it makes one of these little fibers that should then are woven together to make a very, very strong material that can stop a bullet. That's cool. Okay, I think that is all for now. I'll see you in the next video.